the focus of our walk today is going to be looking at the local ecosystem in this particular neighborhood, starting with, with this park, Collect Pond Park. This used to be completely green, this, um, this entire area. There was a giant pond here, the largest, um, or a, a very large source of fresh water to this part of New York. The fresh water source, just to give you a kind of a visual, was about 60 feet deep. So um, over time, things changed. And of course, in the old days, there were tanneries and slaughterhouses and all kinds of activities. And to correct that, um, canals and waterways were dug that would make a path to the Hudson River. Uh, let's take a look at this image here, actually. I think this illustrates what it was. You have the Hudson River and the East River would be here. And there's a story that uh, the native inhabitants of Lenape, when it was high tide on both sides of the river, they could go from a canoe down these estuaries to the collect pond and then back throughout the other side. Even though this little area of land is called Collect Pond Park, the pond actually was an enormous uh, dimension that was probably about the equivalent of like maybe five blocks wide or something. So you can see that here, the, there's a kind of overlay of the current city blocks on top of what the kind of old pond look like. So when you think about uh, ecosystem in cities, what, what comes to mind? Well, of course, uh, flora, fauna, but there's a whole bunch of other things that contribute to that. As we were just saying, there's uh, the issue of garbage. There's hu what humans are doing. There's, there's a number of issues that contribute to what constitutes an ecosystem. One of the things that's of interest to me is the issue of animals in cities. And while sometimes what we see things like birds and we're very kind of excited by seeing birds in cities, there's also the issue of nuisance animals. But what we would like to kind of talk about in addition to, you know, rats, which I know many New Yorkers are, you know, think quite a lot about is the kind of environment that the rat is situated in, what, what kind of factors contribute to uh, its habitat and um, what its habitat also contributes to the environment as well. We'd like to just kind of talk a little bit about some of the conditions that rats need in order to, to live. And some, some of them are, are going to be quite obvious. So one of them, of course, is food. And um, so when you see things like open garbage bags, bags that are, you know, kind of sitting on the ground, which you see a lot of in New York City, um, that's something that is clearly, you know, a source of food for, for rats. The second thing is what the environment is. So rats typically live underground. They burrow in soil. So when you have a situation like this where there's a lot of soil around, and especially if it's nearby a food source, so if there's garbage around that's open or a restaurant nearby with open garbage bags and the kind of combination with soil, that's a perfect cocktail for rat habitat. They are animals that like to touch things as they move. So, um, so this is why alleyways are, are uh, environments that are especially good for them because, because they're narrow, they can run along the wall. So if there's like a curb or a wall or something, or even if it's just like a pipe, yeah, um, they'll, they, they prefer to almost have like one side of their body flanking uh, some kind of surface. They like to have um, two exits. Emergency exits. So they have an emergency exit, um, which is camouflaged and then one, you know, for regular use. Um, this park growing up was filled with rats. It was unbelievable. In the middle of the day, they'll be running around. It was a really big part of the park. But we have one of the few examples in this park of how rat tunneling would look and, uh, and where it usually exists. Right here, you have two holes, one underneath this rock and one underneath this tree and the crotch of the tree there. So they like to build next to a pre-existing structure. So a tree or a rock are great because then you don't you only have to do half the digging. The rock is an insulation source. It you know protects it from rain or whatever. You ever go and lift up a rock and there's tons of insects there? These are like coral reefs in an ocean of soil. Just think of it that way. Like they're great things to latch onto and build around. Oh, but I think one of the main reasons why it's so successful is the garbage cans we're going to see in this park. This garbage is really what sustains them. If you look behind you, this big belly solar thing uh, is very much so rat proof. They can't access that food anymore. Um, and so they have to go elsewhere. And so this park isn't a viable resource for them the same way it used to be. So there's an amazing human ecology happening here. This is a real gathering center of people and things and animals. Uh, and what's going on here is that leaves are accumulating. And I don't know if you can see, I saw one earlier, 
but you're gonna, they're over there. You have these little birds dancing around in the soil. And they look like house sparrows, besides they have black and white straps on their, uh, stripes on their head, and they're native sparrows. And they're coming here as they would for thousands of years, looking for insects under the leaves. Um, and this is, so if you were to leave it, it would slowly transform into a native habitat where these birds would be existing. And it would be less favorable for the exotic birds, such as house sparrows, pigeons, and mammals like rats. Those who are working to try to change human behaviors so that rat populations will shift and maybe even diminish, say that the way to change human behavior is to learn how to think like rats. I want you to draw from above a, just a little section right here and then draw the pathway of a rat from his life underground to his food source. Really think like a rat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>